Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Vivek Shetty, Director of the Training Core for the MD2K Center of Excellence. I want to invite you to today's uh, webinar, which is a double header by uh, Karen Aufsepian and Hilol Sarkar. Uh, today's uh, webinar focuses on C stress and just in time interventions. <clears throat> In the first half of the seminar, we will be covering a computational model for cont continuous measurement of uh, stress from physiological responses. In the second half, uh, Hilol will uh, present on uh, time series pattern mining methods that mine time series of C stress outputs and optimal uh, strategies for triggering uh, just-in-time stress interventions in the mobile environment. <clears throat> uh, Karen is now an assistant professor of computer science at Troy University, where he specializes in machine learning and data mining. And uh, Hilol uh, is a graduate student at the University of Memphis, working with uh, Santosh Kumar. I want to welcome you all and uh, hand over to uh, Karen to begin. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your introduction, uh, Vivek. Um, so I will um, get into it right away. Um, so um, uh, why do we want to uh, um, infer stress? So obviously, as the slide uh, shows, uh, stress is a precursor and a factor in a whole slew of uh, uh, behavioral um, uh, and uh, medical issues such as depression, heart disease, migraines, diabetes, smoking, alcohol abuse. So, so there's a, a, a very serious reasons uh, for uh, trying to measure stress um, in the wild when these activities actually can occur. So um, the next slide is uh, uh, show, asking an important question: Why do we want? Why, why do we care about autonomous stress assessment, which is what this work is about? Uh, so, um, as the, the, the key, the key, I guess, uh, arguments are that uh, manual reporting of stress by the person uh, is often inaccurate and inconsistent. And even though we actually end up using uh, manual reporting uh, uh, to try to validate our models, uh, you know, we uh, take, take painstaking care to make sure that um, the manual reporting used for validation is uh, high quality. But to uh, depend on manual reporting in general cases is just not going to be very, uh, uh, very good. So we would like a, an accurate autonomous stress assessment that can be used in the wild and and in the, in the field and help us um, detect when a person has is experiencing uh, arousal due to stress. So uh, the other reason is that if if we can autonomously detect stress, we can certainly provide autonomous just-in-time intervention, which is what um, Hilal will discuss in the second half of this of this talk. Okay. So um, and finally, with uh, again, if you, if you can do this autonomously, you could look back on your day and do uh, and really study exactly when and how stress occurred, uh, what were the different factors around those uh, stress events. So you can you can create these high resolution stress maps and a high resolution visualization of uh, stress events during the day. Um, okay. Uh, so, what are the challenges associated with stress uh, measurement, stress assessment? So, first of all, um, there is no uh, stress being so important as the previous slide showed. Unfortunately, there uh, uh, is um, the field is lacking um, a gold standard for uh, a stress assessment, um, and uh, which is kind of what we hope is our work. Um, is a solid push in that direction towards pr pr producing a gold standard. Uh, but even the stress the hormone cortisol, for example, is has, shows very poor uh, a correlation with uh, the self uh, the the, the, the self-reported um, stress. Um, so unfortunately, there isn't there there is a deep need for a stress measurement or model for stress measurement that is accurate and validated. Um, and so. Uh, the challenges of producing such a model are that, uh, first of all, the data that we get from our sensors are inherently noisy because they're being used in a natural environment when a person 
goes through many different uh, uh, activities. And so maybe in a future where the technology is, is, is much, much better, uh, we might have a lot less noise. But right now, we, uh, even we have great technology, but <laughs> still has some noise. And so, for example, one of the reasons for noise is physical activity. We are physical creatures, so we will, uh, our sensors have to, uh, will be used during moments of physical activity. And so, uh, uh, in addition to that, we can drink uh, a coffee, we can uh, drink alcohol, we can drink all these things that confound and interfere with uh, our, our, our physical arousal. And finally, the challenge was that, that really one of, the, one of the bigger challenges that we experienced was how do we validate our model in a field or in the wild where we don't have a, a really accurate uh, uh, ground truth, meaning that when the actual stress occurred. Uh, so this, uh, this presented a challenge and we, we will discuss later how we try to uh, address this challenge. So sea stress is our model proposed model of physiological stress arousal, and uh, it addresses the four challenges we mentioned before in the previous slide. The model is composed of five components. So the first component is data collection. In data collection, we use the biometric sensors to uh, collect various signals, uh, such as, and the, the, uh, this, actually, we use a sensor suite which can collect a whole slew of of, of biosignals, uh, bio, uh, bio but we, uh, the two that we care about are respiration and ECG. Uh, the respiration is collected using uh, a special belt, RIP, uh, a belt, which is a belt that measures the expansion of your chest cavity, and ECG is uh, measured using uh, um, electrodes that are attached to the body. Uh, so uh, we also uh, make use of accelerometry, uh, which is used to compute physical activity and detect uh, uh, a moderate physical activity. So during this data collection phase, we collect all of the signals that are needed by the model. Once that's done, we move to signal pre-processing, which is a very important step because we make sure that in this step that uh, the data are clean, that um, the data the, 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 is, is relatively noise-free. Um, so it's a, it turns out to be a very important step. As, as the three, as the, as the, as the slide shows, there's time-to-time -time correction, there's data interpolation, there's quality control. So all these steps were, were very crucial to, for, for making the model more accurate. Once we do that, we can then move on to compute the features. So the features are essentially values that represent the signals. So we can now, the model itself, the c stress model itself, deals with these numerical values, these numerical features. And uh, so we need to compute those features. We need to extract this numerical, rich numerical information from the actual time series signals so that we can input that into the model and the model can measure the stress. Uh, the model itself, actually, as we'll see later, is a classifier, binary classifier, which is given a vector of these numerical features and uh, for a given minute of a day, and for that minute uh, outputs the probability of uh, stress arousal. And so the parameters of this classifier, of this model, need to be learned. So this is where machine learning comes in, and that's the fourth uh, step, is where we use uh, 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 machine learning to learn the parameters of this model. Uh, and then this is where you go through many steps of validation, many cycles of validation, cross-validation. So you do all of that. Once you finish with that, you have learned a model, and that model can be now deployed in the field or in the lab, uh, of course, we care mostly about the field deployment. And that's finally the last step where we have a full model and we can deploy it in the field, try to validate it in the field as well, try to make sure that it works well, and then apply it in many different uh, um, uh, projects that, that uh, uh, can use stress measurement as a factor. Okay? Uh, one last step is, one last, one last note is that the parameters that I discussed, the parameters are learned using data collected uh, during specially designed lab study sessions, which we'll discuss uh, uh, in the next uh, slides. Uh, during these lab study sessions, uh, uh, subjects, participants were, uh, um, uh, got, went through specially designed protocols elic uh, that designed to elicit stress response, stress arousal, so that we know exactly when uh, stress arousal occurs so that we can use those exact markings uh, to train in a supervised uh, way, trained the the C stress model. Okay, so how is this model? Uh, how is our effort uh, a step towards a gold standard? Uh, well, uh, it achieves high accuracy. It is reproduced, validated on independently collected data sets. First of all, um, 
on many desks. So we make sure it went through, went through expensive uh, uh, validation. It achieves pretty high accuracy. In a lab, it achieves 90%, over 90% recall and under 5% false positive rate. In a field, there's accuracy of greater than 70%, which is a good, um, a, a, a good benchmark a threshold uh, to pass. Um, and, uh, and, and considering especially 70% might seem low, but considering self-reports are inherently noisy, 70% in the field is actually a pretty good number. So let's move on to the data that we collected for this study. So the first data set is called, we, we nickname it TRAIN, and this is the data collected through our lab study session. In this, uh, uh, in this, uh, for this data, 21 participants uh, um, uh, participated in the study, and this data was used to train the model. And as I mentioned previously, uh, uh, during this uh, uh, study, uh, each participant went through three uh, uh, um, uh, protocols for stress arousal, uh, uh, to, and there, uh, the three protocols meant to elicit social stress. Uh, this is basically public, public speaking, for example, mental stress, which is done through uh, asking the participants to do mental arithmetic, and physical stress or discomfort, which is elicited by uh, asking the participant to put their hand in cold, icy water. So again, this, this data was, uh, uh, has uh, uh, markings for every minute that, uh, that tell whether that minute is stress arousal or not stress arousal, which is used by, uh, uh, in, a, in a later stages to train a model. Uh, we also did the same kind of study, uh, separate on totally different participants, uh, um, uh, and we, we were gonna use this data to validate and test our model, and that data set is called TEST. Again, same protocol but 26 different participants. And final data set is a data set uh, collected in the field. Participants, 23 participants, wore sensors for a week doing their normal, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the, in the um, real world, uh, going through their normal activities. And uh, where, uh, and additionally, they self-reported stress levels at random times during the day. And these self-reported stress levels were used to uh, test the performance of the model. Okay. Um, so, how do we make sure that um, you know our model can be can can, can use the best possible features uh, with the lowest number of lowest lowest amount of noise? So, first of all, we used a very robust sensor suite, AutoSense, which uh, uh, again is the is uh, represents the the core of many studies performed at MD2K. Um, and we use the ECG and RIP, as I mentioned, but again, the auto sensor includes many other sensors. Um, and we also, on top of that, uh, developed a rigorous data processing uh, pipeline. So we made sure that the timestamps were all aligned and corrected, so there were no uh, gaps or there were no compressions or, 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 or uh, um, uh, uh, extensions of the timestamps. Uh, so every single uh, point in the time series uh, uh, came in at the exactly the same uh, um, uh, uh, the exactly the same interval. Uh, we then interpolated missing samples as long as they were not uh, really too uh, gaps were not too large, and we also made sure that we detected when a, when the sensors produced an output uh, noisy noisy data because we certainly don't want to do inference on top of noisy signals. So what is AutoSense? AutoSense, again, it incorporates many different sensors, uh, and it's used not just for stress measurement, but it's also has been used successfully for drug use uh, detection, for smoking. Uh, again, uh, 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 a lot of papers at MD2K have, have used successfully this, this suite, the sensor suite. So, um, and uh, um, for us, we use, for our, for our study, we use the, uh, the, the, the two sensors, ECG and RIP, uh, and we also use the, uh, the accelerometer that also sits on top of the belt. So these three sensors uh, are used for, uh, for our study, okay? Um, all right, so after we collected the data using AutoSense, after we uh, went through and pre-processed the data, made sure that the data was, uh, uh, you know, didn't have uh, major issues with it, now we can extract this numerical feature. So the two, we extract two different numerical features. Uh, I just kind of went ahead to show the RIP is the next slide from ECG and RIP. So for ECG, uh, uh, what we did is we first, so what are, the, what are the numerical features that we care about? What we care about are the peaks, uh, or called the R peaks, um, um, 
which occur naturally in the ECG signal, uh, which indicate the major, uh, the, 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 the major, the main um, beat uh, uh, or the pulse in the, in the heart. And so we first took the signal, and you can see the, the slide shows on the right um, where it says acceptable signal, where you can see that a normal uh, looking uh, ECG signal. So in that ECG signal, we are detecting the R peaks, which are the black dots. Okay, and uh, so this detected we use uses a classic algorithm, Penn and Tompkins algorithm. It's been many many years for this algorithm, but it's, it's it's still used. Once you can compute the R peaks, you can compute the intervals between those peaks, and uh, we also make sure that the, the sometimes uh, intervals are uh, don't are not really co accurate. Uh, for example, you can see with the red star that uh, that interval between those two R peaks is actually too long. This might have happened because there was de degradation of signal and we did not detect the R peak that should have been there between those, those two R peaks. So because we didn't detect that R peak, the interval between those R peaks is going to be too long. It's, it's, it's uh, so most likely noisy and, and, and we want to discount that R, R to R interval. So we, we certainly make sure that we do that and we don't uh, incorporate our R to R intervals, which are again uh, incorrect. After that, we normalize the R to R intervals. Normalization basically means that we will uh, uh, look at every participant and we will try to say, depending on, uh, based on their daily or their baseline R to R intervals, uh, which are, of course are specific to each person, uh, uh, what, what should be their R to R uh, interval again in, in, after you account for their average and also account for their standard deviation. So we normalize these these intervals and that allows us by the way to pool all many different participants into one big uh, data set uh, once because once you normalize the r to r intervals you can do that. So once we again so once we detect the r to r intervals detect and remove noisy r to r intervals normalize the r to r intervals uh, we can now use these R2R info intervals to compute statistics for every minute of data. And uh, on, in, the, in the table, you can see all the various statistics that we compute and aggregations that we compute uh, uh, for each minute. So we can compute the variance of R2R intervals for a minute, the quartile deviation, the low frequency energy. These are frequency domain features, uh, medium frequency energy, high frequency energy, the ratio of low to high, we can compute the mean, the median, okay? So we compute all these statistical features. Okay, so these features uh, will be used for every minute. These features will be used as input to the model, which we, which we discussed previously, okay? So keep uh, remember these features uh, are, are, new, are numbers. Each one is a number, of, uh, which again represents that aggregation or that statistic uh, over the R2R intervals of a single minute, okay? Uh, we do the same thing for RIP because we also want to include respiration. So for RIP, of course, the features are going to be very different. There is no R, R peak, for example, for respiration. Instead, there is the actual natural inspiration uh, and expiration, uh, which is basically where you inspire and you expire. So you, 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 you breathe in and you breathe out. So we want to detect each breath cycle and then, and again, separate that cycle into the breath and then, uh, and then um, your, uh, uh, and then, uh, the uh, um, uh, ex uh, where you ex where you exhale. Okay, so we apply a different technique to do those. We uh, we locate those respiration cycles as the slide shows. We detect and remove invalid cycles just like we did with removing invalid R two R intervals. So we detect and remove invalid cycles based on once we have all the correct cycles, we compute these base features. The base features are again numerical values that that that. Um, describe that cycle numerically by using just some 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 numbers so for example we would like to uh, uh, compute the duration of the inspiration interval we would like to measure the duration of the expiration interval right we would like to measure the entire duration of the entire respiration cycle which includes inspiration and expiration uh, there's also the the ratio of inspiration to expiration Besides that, we also have stretch, which is the difference between the peak and the highest point and the lowest point in, the, in, the, in that respiration cycle. And we also co uh, uh, compute something called respiration sinus arrhythmia. So, uh, so once we compute these base features, 
we will, again, just like we did with ECG, we will compute, first of all, we will normalize them, just like we did with R, R to R intervals. And then we will compute, just like we did with R to R intervals, one minute statistics of all of these base features. And the statistics that we'll compute are the mean, the median, the 80th percentile, and the quartile deviation. So again, these uh, five, um, uh, sorry, these four statistics over all of these base features make up the set of one minute uh, uh, features that again explain uh, the, the respiration cycles during that minute. And these numbers again are, will be added on to the RIP, to the ECG features that we, that we described, and that set of rich uh, representation, numerical representation of one minute's worth of, uh, um, of, of physiological data will be input to the model. Okay. Oh, and also I forgot, there's also breath rate and inspiration minute five. Okay, so how do we learn stress? So stress is basically, as I mentioned before, a binary classifier. You give it a minute, a minute's worth of these ECG and RIP uh, features, and the model will output, uh, either it can output a binary label, telling you whether that minute is stress arousal or non-stress arousal, or it can also output a probability of stress arousal, which is actually something that's more useful Okay, so it's a binary classifier. It is trained using the well-known uh, algorithm called support vector machines. And uh, again, uh, 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 we use in this to, to, to train it, you also need the ground truth. For every minute, you need to know whether that minute was stress arousal or not stress arousal. And luckily, in the, in the lab study session, we, uh, pr we produced these markings. And so we can use, uh, uh, again, uh, these, these data, these features, plus the ground truth labels for every minute to uh, uh, use support vector machines to train this binary classifier. Okay? The uh, algorithm uses certain hyperparameters, and these hyperparameters were optimized by maximizing the F1 uh, score uh, of the model. Okay? And one final note is that we used uh, cross-subject validation, which is that we where we trained, we we uh, we kept one uh, uh, participant's data out. We trained using the rest of the participants, and then we uh, 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 got the, and then we predicted the or received the accuracy on this one withheld participant. And you did this for every single participant by withholding that participant. You get um, a sense of how well the model does when it's been trained on one a cohort of participants and then applied on a completely different withheld cohort. And so this gives a better sense of how well the model will perform in the future. So let's discuss quickly the val lab validation results. So, um, so you can see in the table we have uh, um, uh, four rows. The four rows correspond to the four subsets of features because we wanted to compare which features are actually more predictive. So in the top row, you have all the features. Again, all the ECG and RIP features combined. They have an accuracy or they have an area under the rock curve of 0.96 and F1 score of 0.81. The hit rate or the accuracy is 0.93. So these are very good results. Okay, You will also see the, that the false positive rate is quite low. Uh, so the, uh, if we just use ECG features, that those numbers drop down, drop off, right? Uh, because it turns out we do need RIP. If we only use, out of the ECG features, if we only use the heart rate variability features, uh, then the numbers drop off even more. And, and this was kind of to show that heart rate variability features, which have been shown in, the, in literature to be very powerful, actually are, by themselves, they lack predictive power. And RIP features, again, by themselves. So this kind of outlines and summarizes the results in the lab. We also, as we said, validated on the set test, which, again, had the same protocol had the ground truth markings for every minute and on that set we produced uh, pretty good results we produced a median of 0.9 for f1 actually higher even than on our train set and accuracy of 0.95 and area under the curve of median of 0.98 so the box plot shows the results over all of the 26 participants in that data set okay so pretty good results in the lab on two data sets so let's move on to the field um, and I'll try to finish up soon. So, um, as we so so in a field, uh, participants collected a ground truth. Uh, uh, participants recorded their levels of stress, average uh, about 15 times per day at random random times, 
and there was a total of 1,600, almost uh, or a little over 1,600 self-reports over you know uh, uh, over all the participants. So again, uh, uh, these self-reports measured persons' uh, um, self-assessed level of stress at random times during the day. We will use these self-assessed levels to validate our model. So um, this slide very quickly is uh, discusses that if we want to use this model in the field, we have to make sure that we discount and we avoid, uh, or rather uh, we, we suspend the stress inference during those minutes where we detect moderate physical activity. And as Hill shows, he actually expands on this work and, and he shows that we also need to um, suspend the stress inference following stress uh, physical activity as well. Um, so once you've done that, um, we will move on quickly, and I'll try to finish up soon, is that uh, we will uh, um, use a different model to essentially to use the previously trained and optimized C-stress model as a signal for inferring the self-reported levels of stress. Okay? So this model is a simple Bayesian network model, and uh, the, the figure shows uh, basically the structure of the model. The idea is that uh, for a minute i, your self-reported stress level will depend on two things. It depends on, or it's condition, conditionally dependent on uh, the what you mentioned, what you wrote, or what, you, what the level of, of stress was in a previous minute. Okay, that's SI minus one. So what your self-reported stress was for the previous minute. And also what was the stress activation or stress arousal during the previous minute. So you kind of have the physical evidence uh, due to zi minus one, so due to the C stress output, and uh, your own uh, subjective um, a measure of stress during the previous minute. These two will now can will be used. Uh, uh, they they they, they uh, are factors for uh, uh, the uh, uh, the level of self-reported stress during the next minute, minute i. Okay, so it's a very simple Bayesian network. The table on the right shows the, uh, the parameters of this Bayesian network. That's the conditional probability table. Uh, and it shows that uh, when, when, when both the previous stress arousal and previous self-report was 1, then probability of stress arousal for a minute i is 1. Uh, however, when the previous stress arousal was 1, but the previous self-report was 0, meaning that it was not stressed, then we use a parameter called alpha to denote the probability of self-reported stress uh, for a minute i. Okay. So in other words, there was uh, uh, there was uh, there was no sorry there was no uh, physical evidence of of stress arousal in the previous minute, but the person said they were stressed during the previous minute. So we will use alpha as a parameter that we'll learn, and uh, and and vice versa. If we say that there was a physical evidence of stress in the previous minute, but the person said they were not stressed in the previous minute. Then we'll use a parameter beta to denote the probability of stress during minute i. Okay, so this table, these two parameters, parameters can be learned. That they are learned again to maximize the F1 score of the uh, of the model in 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 classifying every every minute as stress or non-stress. Uh, again, this model is a model of self-reported stress. Okay, so. Um, this model uh, shows results, as this table shows, uh, that uh, in the field, when we apply this model, the median F1 was 0.71, median accuracy was 0.72, with median area under the curve of 0.60. Okay, we also did the same thing in the train data, because in the train they had self-reports as well. Um, but, um, and the, 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 the figure below shows a bar plots over all of the participants, uh, showing their accuracy. And you can see some of the participants had very high, for some of the participants, the model was very accurate in, in classifying their minutes as, uh, and, and, and essentially inferring accurately uh, the ground truth or the, the true self-reports. But for some participants, they were very low. Like in the, bottom, in the right side, you'll see some participants' accuracy was point, slightly over 0.4, and one of the reasons, as he will show, is that some participants did not were not really as accurate as they should have been in reporting their their, their uh, self reports, uh, in reporting their stress. Okay, uh, so again, the accu the accuracy is varies across participants, but the median accuracy was 0.72.
Uh, the final slide I have is that we uh, went through and we uh, looked a little um, uh, 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 deeper into which features are more predictive than others. Okay, so in addition to lumping and creating two or four subsets of features, as we showed previously, we will actually you can use a technique called multiple kernel learning to go through and um, look at every feature separately. So we do this by in support vector machine. Um, um, uh, um, a formulation, you can assign a kernel for every feature, okay? And the kernel essentially describes actually the, the similarities of observations to each other. It's, a, it's essentially a, um, a covariance measure. So, uh, uh, so we can build a kernel, we can use a kernel for every feature, and then this multiple kernel learning algorithm, which we use uh, the variant called simple MKL. So this algorithm can learn the weights for every kernel, and by doing that, it's essentially learning the weights for every feature. And the weights correspond to the contribution of the kernel to the final model. So essentially, we can learn the contribution of the features to, towards the final model. And if we plot these features ranked by their, uh, in order of their weights, we can essentially find out, we can see which features are more relevant uh, and more predictive than others. And the, the figure actually... Uh, agrees with what we saw previously is that ECG is more relevant and more predictive than RIP. And among ECG, the best feature was apparently 80th percentile of the RR interval. So that uh, kind of shows us. So for example, this is, might be useful in those cases if I, let's say, didn't have RIP, or if I can only use one or two features, which features should I collect and measure and, 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 and compute so that my model can at least have the highest, the best, uh, uh, highest accuracy. That, so this shows that the best feature, the, if, if I had to bank on one feature alone, it would be 80th percentile of our interval. So uh, I think my time is up, and I'll just say that, um, just to finally, what are the limitations and future work for, uh, uh, that we want to focus? We certainly want to keep improving the accuracy. We need to develop the data collection methods. We need to handle the activity better, instead of, for example, just uh, you know uh, discounting and turning off inference during those minutes. Are there other things we can do? We can use EMA better. There's more, the, 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 the CMA, the self-reports can give us more data, more contextual data actually, that we could use to improve the model. And, uh, and further clinical applications, for example, Hillel is gonna look at just-in-time intervention. So we will need to develop further applications to make use of this. Uh, and, and that I think is very much, uh, uh, is happening right now. And, and finally integrate our model with other sensors and other data. So on this slide, on this note, I think I will finish, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have at the end of this webinar. So um, on that note, I um, I think I will stop. And uh, and Hilal, you're, you're you're up. Thank you, Ken. Okay. So in this uh, next part of the presentation. Uh, I'll talk about our work on finding significant stress episode in a discontinuous time series of rapidly varying mobile sensor data. This work is accepted in CHI 2016. Success of just-in-time intervention depends on the timing of intervention, that is when to in provide an intervention, content, that is what to provide in that intervention, and modality, that is how to provide that intervention. The timing has two parts. One is whether the person is available for a task like intervention, which requires significant user involvement. Another is when to generate a trigger for an, for an intervention. I'm going to talk about this part in this presentation. Physiolog physiological stress can be detected from ECG and respiration, which we have seen in the first part of the presentation. Stress can also be detected from other sensors such, such as EDA sensors or PPG-based sensors. Potential stress interventions can be changing amb ambient light, meditation, breathing exercise, or via self-reflection. Self Our work is a breeze between stress detection and intervention delivery by providing the timing for just-in-time stress intervention. The problem in stress assessment is how to define stress. And we have to deal with confounders such as physical activity, which 
uh, occurs frequently in our daily life. We have to deal with noisy data, for example, random spikes in the stress likelihood time series. And we have to deal with missing data due to wireless signal loss and so on. Ultimate problem is given a piecewise continuous time series of stress assessments, we want to identify the precise timing uh, for intervention. As an overview of the approach, at first we'll detect stress and confounder from uh, the sensor measurements. Then we'll construct a stress likelihood time series. Then we'll uh, identify stress episodes in that time series. Then we uh, infer context such as environmental disorder from GPS. At the end, uh, we'll check the applications of the model such as stress patterns in the daily life or prediction of proactive intervention. So in the study, we use the same autosense sensors that is uh, discussed in the first part of the presentation where there is a chest belt that collects respiration, two electrode collecting EC data and it and also there is an accelerometer in the chest mode and all this data together is transmitted wirelessly to the phone phone stores this data along with its phone sensor data uh, we uh, we collected 38 participants data for a four week long study they are opioid dependent participants and we co uh, collected around 11 hours of data per day and around six self report per day so next we want to construct the time series from sensor assessments. So for this, we detect stress from, um, I mean, ECG and respiration that we have seen uh, in the first part of the presentation. Uh, I mean, uh, the model uh, that is presented in the first part of the presentation that provides stress assessments scaled between zero and one for each minute. We'll refer this prob probability-like measure as stress likelihood from now afterward. To get a smoother time series, we inferred stress for every five seconds from overlapping minute windows. One of the major confounder for stress assessment is physical activity, which we detect from accelerometer, chest accelerometer. So then we uh, see here that in this figure, uh, the heart rate actus time, we see that uh, during the activity period, which is marked as red region, so during that activity period, the heart rate increases, and at the end of the activity, uh, I mean, the heart rate recovers exponentially to the baseline following this equation. So we, uh, we learned the recovery rate tau for each participant, and then uh, at the end of an activity episode, we use the same equation while we know the tau for each participant, we use the same equation to estimate the recovery time after an activity episode is over. So the activity episode and the time it requires to, uh, for physiology to recover to the baseline, the entire period, we discard it for stress assessment because those are uh, confounder. Numerous literature says that uh, we can discard, uh, I mean, say after a activity episode, it takes no more than two minutes to recover uh, to, uh, to the baseline. So a person, I mean, we have seen in the study that a person is around 23% time, they are uh, physically active. If we discard a constant two minutes after each activity, no matter it is, five seconds or 10 seconds or 15 seconds or one minute. If we discard the constant two minute data after an, each activity, we'll end up losing 35% more. While using the proposed approach, using this equation that is mentioned here, we'll end up losing 7.4% only. So this activity period and the recovery period, we discard this data because those are confounding and there is also missing data. This introduced discontinuity in the time series. We found that missing data is not missing not at random. We believe that missing data is missing at random because stress can be explained by other observed contexts such as time of day, day of week, previous stress level, slope and intercept. 
we used a KNIS neighbor approach to impute the missing data and we get a continuous time series of stress assessments. Next, we validate the stress assessments with the participant's self-report. And to evaluate, we use F1 score. So we have seen that, um, I mean, the F1 score, the median F1 score across all participants is around 0.7. However, there are five participants at the end, you can see here is for them, uh, we do not have uh, a good agreement between self-report and um, the CIST assessment. So why is that? So one of the reason can be the, uh, there can be bias in the self-report. For example, a person um, may be biased towards providing a neutral self-report. For example, if we ask a person, are you stressed? And we want, to, we want them to provide self-report in a Likert scale from one to six, Maybe the majority of times they may pro, uh, they say three that is neutral, and also there may be carelessness in the self report. So uh, to check that, we assess their self report consistency that is Cronbeck Alpha. We find that for those five percent participants, the median Cronbeck Alpha is around 0.3, which is significantly lower. Uh, in compared to the overall Cronbeck Alpha of the whole study, that is 0.8. So finding like this suggests that we need an objective measure of stress uh, to uh, for intervention delivery purpose. Ne uh, now we have a time series of stress men, and from that we want to identify stress episodes in the time series. So let's say this is a stress likelihood time series. At A, stress likelihood starts increasing at C it is at peak and at D uh, it is uh, all, uh, I mean at the end I'm at the end I mean it uh, the decreasing is ended and it again started increasing so from A to D the whole episode uh, whole period we call it an episode in the time series and if we want to provide an intervention a reactive intervention that is after an activity uh, after an stress episode is over we want to provide an intervention reactive intervention then we, we may want to provide a d however if we want to provide a proactive intervention uh, i mean like stress started accumulating and we want to provide at an early stage we may want to provide at a a may be too early uh, in this case we may provide at b while we we are to some extent confident enough that the stress uh, this episode will end up being a significant one so how to find this a c d and how to obtain this episode we get help from stock an oil known stock prediction model that is MSCD. so where the uh, uh, the main idea is like what is the trend in short term in compared to long term. So here in the figure, we see that um, the MACD line and the uh, signal line, the blue and red line. So when there, inter uh, when there is an intersection, this means a change in trend. From A to C, where um, uh, like the blue line, that is MACD is above signal, that is an increasing trend. And here, when the red line is above blue line, that is a decreasing trend. So the whole and increasing trend immediately followed by a decreasing trend, we call the entire thing as an episode in the time series. Next, we identify stress, epi uh, I mean, we find the distribution of stress likelihood. We find that stress likelihood follow beta distribution. We take 95, 95th percentile for each participant and above which we term it as high likelihood of stress for that participant. Among those episodes which contains high likelihood of stress, um, I mean, no, we, here, here is a distribution of uh, those uh, durations and we find that the stress duration follow log normal distribution. We define significant stress episode as a stress episode which is which contains high likelihood of stress and persists for significant time. 
and momentized stress episode is otherwise. So we observe that the significant stress episode with duration more than 13.5 minutes, we can expect on average 0.5 per day or once per two day. For SSCs or significant stress episodes with duration more than 2.4 minutes, we can expect two per day. There are on average 9.2 stress episodes per day, so the remainings are momentary stress episodes. We can pick a duration threshold corresponding to a specific intervention delivery frequency. For example, if we want to provide an intervention which requires significant user involvement, for example, meditation, we may want to provide intervention once per day or once per two day. In case once per two day, we can pick duration threshold of 13.5 minutes or in case of once per day we may want to provide we may want to uh, pick 7.3 minutes as a duration threshold for significant stress episode here is an example of stress likelihood time series where the red regions are significant stress episode and the green ones are momentary stress episodes so we have identified stress episodes and next we infer environmental disorder from GPS and physical activity from accelerometer and use this context to find stress pattern as an application of the model we find stress patterns and eventually um, we uh, we make a model to provide an insight about whether we can build a proactive intervention so the role of priority stress in x axis it is a current stress duration and y is next next stress duration we we can see a correlation of around 0.4 here so this can be explained by a spiral process theory for example a person facing financial trouble may decrease that person's stress coping capability he may respond to other stress events such as being in a noisy environment which may otherwise easy to deal with so here x axis is participants and y axis is stress density so what is stress density stress density is the area under the stress likelihood time series per unit time we can see that there is a wide between person person differences in stress density if we if we pick the participant with highest stress density there is wide between day differences too so it's, it implies that uh, the i mean the model that uh, for detecting stress uh, i mean stress intervention that need to be personalized for each participant and for each day here we find that the weekday versus weekend what is the stress density and we do not find a significant difference between weekday and weekend maybe because those participants um, i mean most of the participants do not have uh, a nine to five day job and um, so that's why maybe uh, there is no significant difference between weekday and weekend in active day uh, is more likely stressful than morning and night after an walk uh, people are uh, those participants are more likely stressful than after being idle so why is that maybe they are exposed to certain neighborhood which uh, i mean leads to being stress stressed so we uh, we check the environmental effect on stress uh, here uh, we find that being in a noisy environment or trash in street or presence of graffiti, cigarette birds, or uh, bars. So presence of them are highly associated with stress. While youth playing or male adults involved in positive inter, uh, in interaction, those are least likely stressful. So here is a disorder map of the city. So on top of disorder map, we uh, overlaid one participant's stress assessments on top of that disorder map we find that there are certain places in in the city where participants are more likely stressed so 
uh, I mean uh, those places which are marked as highly disorder. So the prediction of proactive stress, stress intervention. So if the if at B when the stress likelihood is in an increasing trend that is detected from MACD and if it crosses certain threshold, for example, binary stress class, classification threshold, we want to predict the, uh, that whether the stress episode will, will end up as being a significant one. We compute features such as time of time and day, slope and intercept of the time series, prior time series, prior stress, density and skewness, uh, location, physical activity. And when we develop a model, uh, we find that the performance is around uh, kappa around 0.45. This figure uh, at the uh, at the bottom, it is uh, the x-axis is triggering frequency of stress intervention, and y the two y-axis is prediction recall and precision. So for a triggering frequency, we can find that what is the precision and recall. This may be useful for, for intervention delivery. Uh, those who are designing the intervention delivery, and they can pick a triggering frequency of intervention, and for that serves their uh, specific position and recall. <clears throat> As a future work, uh, I mean, in this, uh, I mean, we were asking the users to input the expected number of interventions per day. An alternate approach can be by using the confidence in stress detection as a parameter and which can be learned from lab study and conducting a micro randomized trial is a natural next step thank you and we'll uh, we'll be happy to answer your question if any well hilal and uh, karen thank you very uh, both for a wonderful presentation uh, i open it up to the audience if there are any questions uh, they will be happy to uh, take them and answer I had a question. Thank I'm you. not sure if anyone else. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so that that um, finding that before the or after the walk, you're more stressed than you are after being idle. Have you specifically tested whether that possibly has anything to do with the physical activity, perhaps affecting? I mean, I know you said that you removed some of the signal when the physical activity is high, but is it possible that um, there's some activity that you didn't remove that is still affecting those scores? And have you looked at that? Specifically, uh, we uh, checked. Uh, I mean, uh, using a non-parametric test, we uh, checked that whether uh, there is a significant difference, and we have found that there is a significant difference. And while we omit those periods, uh, I mean, that requires the heart rate to go to baseline, the previous baseline. So we discard that, but still. After that, we find that maybe because this is a drug addict population, the, this population for this study is drug addict, so they may uh, visit some, say, bad neighborhood or they look for drugs and they meet certain people, and maybe that's why, uh, that maybe that's the reason for being uh, this kind of observation. Like after an activity, we have seen that the stress likelihood is higher in compared to uh, when they are stayed at idle, maybe at home. So, in compared to home, when they are searching for uh, drugs or say meet, uh, go to some bad neighborhood or meet uh, other drug addict people, maybe that's why they are feeling more stressed. That is our, I mean, um, that is our hypothesis. Uh, and that does this answer your question? And also, the low socioeconomic status may yes. uh, indicate that they may be looking for jobs or I mean, looking for their livelihood. So, uh, drug use may not be as frequent as I think uh, something to do with the socioeconomic status. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, thank you all again. Uh, we'll see you at David Better's presentation on April the 7th.